Hello and welcome to Doc NYC 2023's Spring Showcase, celebrating documentary films and series. My name is Samah Ali and I am a senior programmer with the festival and I typically focus on all things shorts and Doc NYCU. But today I have the special pleasure of speaking with the brilliant director, Andi Timoner, on her touching documentary feature, Last Flight Home. A special thank you to Paramount Plus and MTV Documentary Films for this special presentation. Andi, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Sama. Let's get right started. Last Flight Home is such a beautiful film about human life and death. Um, when did you know you needed to make a film about your father's decision to end his life? I knew I needed to record even when he went into the hospital. It was just uh, something that I couldn't help but do. Um, I was really terrified to forget him. And um, when I realized, wait a second, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I've been making films for 30 years. I have cameras. I could actually record everything he says from now until he's gone. Um, I, I thought that is probably a terrible, terrible idea. And I might be trying to mediate my experience of, of this terrifying thing. And maybe I'm hurting my family. And last thing I want to do is, is affect negatively affect any one of my loved ones, including my father, of course, first and foremost. So I went to a therapist and I, I said to her, I feel this great urge to document my father um, in these final weeks. And she said, surprisingly, she said, if you feel you should film, you should film. And so I contacted my father in the hospital and he said, I instinctively know you're on the right track, which I thought was really an interesting answer because I didn't really know any track that I was on, you know, but he was, he wasn't just such a supportive person as you come to, as you've just seen in the film. Um, he was such a loving, gentle, kind, and really wise human being. And so I think maybe he knew more, maybe he knew that I was gonna make this into a film, but it wasn't until my sister asked me to make a memorial video with the footage that I'd shot. Um, and it was two weeks after dad's death that I sat down at the Avid, opened it up to look for five minutes of, of material for a memorial video. And I stood up in a, a week later with a, a 32 minute memorial video. Um, I couldn't stop editing. Dad was alive in the Avid, he was funny. He was changing people's, perception of what he was about to go through and do. He was helping everyone, even though he was the one dying. It was so extraordinary, the, the, the feeling of the footage, you know? I just couldn't stop cutting. And then when we showed the memorial video to the, it, the Zoom memorial, it was clear that the footage, even, even as a memorial video, had changed people's perceptions of death and, um, and was helping people become less scared of this transition. And, helping people to face their own uh, loved ones, uh, death and dying and past or future. Um, and so I thought, you know, this is really powerful material. And this was the greatest, most transform transformational moment of, of my life as a human being. And it felt like I had to share it, you know, like it was almost my responsibility to make a film, to help people with it. Um, so that's what I did. Wow, you just mentioned, um, and I also read at a Guardian article that you were quite hesitant to first start editing, but once you did, it, your father became alive. Um, what did you learn during the making of this documentary that you did not expect when you started? Uh, so I went from grieving daughter with the memorial video to filmmaker, you know, in the edit, and it was possible to do that because dad was where he wanted to be. And I was no longer the caregiving, you know, that I was sort of the chief of his care because I was the one child of his that had an independent filmmaking life and was able to clear my calendar in that way. And I loved being there. I mean, those were actually the most beautiful and sacred weeks of my life. Um, but as I moved into filmmaking mode, um, I really learned a lot through the observational eyes of the camera. I had four cameras usually going and the really challenging part as a filmmaker was to make those cameras disappear, but also make sure they had exactly the right shots um, to bring the audience, later the audience, but to just 
it put us right there with dad. So one camera was shooting through the door of a room, adjacent room, and that had the lav mics. So um, people in my family could go and stand behind that camera and hear what the people at the at dad was saying with whoever was visiting. And it was this unexpected attribute of the whole process, actually. Um, but it allowed people to speak very truthfully and for the filmmaking process not to interfere with what was happening, which was a much bigger thing. Um, my That same therapist told me, however, that we'd all be in shock. And she was absolutely right. I mean, we were, we, we were going through it and it was you know, we like we were walking a plank, which is how I tried to edit the film. So we were, you know, kind of approaching this day that we couldn't get out of March 3rd, a date that dad had chosen. And because he had the power and agency to choose that date, it was extraordinary how his spirit just came to life in that, in that ability. So we wanted to support him in that after 40 years of having been paralyzed, you know, it was very important to us to support that decision, but we felt like we were going, you know, approaching a cliff at that point. So I wanted the film to feel like that. As I was watching the footage, what I picked up on was these arcs, these character arcs, and um, and really how my father, what made my father the extraordinary person and role model that I think he is, um, and that he has always been for me. And that is, if you notice in the film, he always says yes, no matter how tired he is, no matter whether he was asleep two seconds before, dad, we're gonna see the next doctor now, dad, so-and-so wants to visit with you, dad, are you ready for a Zoom with England? You know, yes, yes, let's do it. Yes, I can. And so that really, you know, reminded me of that spirit that I try to carry in my life. Another really important lesson that I learned was that you can't take people's shame away from them. And you see me learn that lesson in the Vidui when my sister is uh, is working with my dad. It's a Jewish deathbed confessional. And my father was able to be extremely open about the shame he was carrying since losing all his money and being ousted from the company simply because he had become disabled from that accidental stroke. And I jump in because I realize that the reason he lost all his money is that he held on to his stock um, as it was falling um, because he didn't want to devalue it for his employees. So I try to jump in to make him feel better. And my sister tells me, you know, stop, here's the exercise. And you see, it's actually a funny moment in a very intense and beautiful scene. I think a very heartbreaking scene. Um, and for me personally, in that moment, it was a massive learning moment, which is why I kept it in the film. Cause I was like, you know, you see, I kind of like, it's not only my older sister, but she's also a rabbi and she's, she's telling me to stop. <laughs> so I just kind of shrink a foot in that scene. And uh, I'm like, you know, and it's um, the audience always laughs then um, at my expense, but it's also like a great learning moment that you can't take people's shame away. So that was another really important moment. And also just the things that we're ashamed of, you know, like the things that I carry of things I might misspeak or things I didn't do quite as well, or did I do it? You know, did I, did I say the right things? Um, and then, you know, we second guess ourselves as human beings. Um, I, that project failed, whatever it is, you know, um, these are not the things that we should be carrying that should be clouding this magical and incredible time we have on earth. And so, I really was motivated to finish the film for that, Sama, like to really get people to take a look at their lives because of my father's, you know, incredible courage and vulnerability. Um, you get to see a man who is great and you know he's great, but he's carrying all of this and how absurd it is really and how tragic it is that he's carrying all of this to the final day before he dies. And so my hope with putting it out there was that we would let things go in our own lives a lot earlier. And so it's really the film kind of became as much about how to live as how to die from his example. Andy, you mentioned about cameras and having four of them. I can imagine that it was incredibly hard to capture uh, this documentary. So what was your camera setup? How many people were behind the camera when you obviously were in front of the camera? And how did you manage editing so much footage from all these different um, points of views? 
So I had, um, I, I had sometimes two cameras. I ended up having four cameras. Um, and the key, as I mentioned, was to have the cameras and the filmmaking process be as really um, as invisible, as unobtrusive, I should say, as possible. Um, but I wanted to be right in there. And um, I wanted, I wanted us to never, I mean, I love close-ups also just as a filmmaker. I like the opportunity that cameras give to really get closer than we almost can as human beings. So I filmed a lot of close-ups um, naturally. And the effect it's subsequently had as it became a film is it really invites the audience to be in the room. Um, but what I knew I needed to do was have the camera that had the most apparatus, the big camera, the C300, to be outside of the room. And uh, luckily, this house that my parents lived in, that my mother lives in, was a house that I bought um, when I was pregnant with my son about to give birth. So that was his room. It was right, it's adjacent to the living room. So I, I, I guess to say I knew the shape of this house. I had lived in this house for many years. You know, I moved when he was eight and so my parents could move in there. So um, right there by his desk of like his old shelf of toys, like I set up the camera that was gonna be the one that had all the mics and everything coming out of it. And then I used a hospital tray for another camera. Um, which was a SLR camera. And I could roll that one around almost like a dolly. And then I, I actually put a Nest camera up on the ceiling to go down over the room. You only see that once, which is what I'm calling Gigi to my father, because by then all the cameras had quit. And so if it wasn't for the Nest camera, we wouldn't even have that continuity shot. Um, and I had another camera behind the TV and then I had a camera that I just always had. And so whenever anybody else visited with dad or whether he had a, a Zoom, um, you know, I, I wanted, I almost kind of produced the end of his life just because I wanted everyone to have a chance to say goodbye to him and for him to realize I had these, you know, my siblings and I had these, these three weeks really to get him to understand that he gave us everything and that he was a great, great man, that he had succeeded in his life when he thought he had failed. Um, so that was like the key conflict and challenge of the, of the whole process. And so, um, I was just filming whenever anyone else was visiting with him. And so I set up, you know, tons and tons of zoom calls for him with everyone from his first employees to, you know, our, our, our au pair when we were children to, you know, old tennis friends and, um, and boy, I think that really laid the groundwork and almost a snow base for my sister to come in and do that for Dewey, because by then he had realized how much love he had managed to place in other people. But um, to answer about camera operators, there were no camera operators really, except for people on my staff who would be, so I have an office because I used to live there. I have an office behind it, behind that house an edit bay. Um, it, I don't know that the film even would have happened if I didn't have that. So, you know, uh, my story producer would come in and make sure that that the, the cameras were still rolling for me. But I was basically setting up all the shots all the time in between because, you know, I was popping up to help nurses or get food or whatever I was doing. I would just kind of run by and look at the cameras. And then my partner, Morgan Doctor, who actually scored the film, she would come to support me in this time. And I'd be like, hey, can you just check and see that the cameras are rolling? And then I would go and like focus them. And then she picked up some really incredible shots just with her iPhone that I wouldn't, nobody else would have been there. I would never have invited a DP to film this uh, and a normal crew because that wasn't what this was about. And it was really um, because I've shot so many Verite films over the years that I was able to do this, I think, um, without a crew. And it, by the, you know, as I said, Morgan shot, like when I would go out to get the drugs, for example, when I went to the messenger, she just started filming, you know, or when dad rolled in on the gurney, I was filming him coming in and she was filming through the window just because she felt like it. And these shots became extremely important in the edit, but, you know, um, I would never have been able to invite a crew or would have thought to invade this incredibly sacred and private situation with a crew per se. It had to be family. Um, the one time that I did arrange for someone else to film, a professional to film, 
was um, the final day of my dad's life when he took when he took his life. Um, and that was because I knew that I needed to be 100 percent, wasn't going to be moving, wasn't going to be I had to be focused on helping dad totally. And um, and then I was also going to be emotionally distraught beyond anything I could imagine. So my friend Tur Turner Jumanville, who shot on my movie Coming Clean about the opioid epidemic, he displayed a lot of compassion in those rooms, in those clinics. And um, I thought of him for this. I asked him if he would would be comfortable doing this. And uh, he came and met my parents a few days before and sat with them and hung out with us a bit. So he knew who he was filming. And then he showed up on that morning and he shot a lot of those beautiful shots on that day. So that's kind of how we, we managed to get it done. But about 500 hours of oh, the edit, you asked me about the edit, 500 hours of footage. Um, and yeah, I, I have one woman I work with named Jenny Hochberg, who a young woman who sat, I would find her crying as she sifted through all the material. And I would say to her, please find me this moment. Every day, the way that I, I think, I think filmmaking, like for me, and I, I've said this, but for me, like it was the first time that documentary filmmaking was really there for me on an emotional level. Like as soon as I turned those cameras on, it was the opposite of mediating that experience. It actually like helped focus me and made me feel totally present because I felt comfortable and safe that nothing my father said would be forgotten, you know, and that I was not going to, because when he was, when he had his stroke, I was nine and a half and I can't remember anything from before that of him being able-bodied. So I think, you know, perhaps it was an irrational fear, but I was worried, like, what if I forget this? And now looking back, I do, and my mother's recommended this in Q and A's, like, I do recommend you film what you can of your loved ones before they die, because as much as you think it will be emblazoned in your brain what happened, you are processing so much shock at that time that really the recording is incredibly therapeutic afterwards. My mother has watched the film over 500 times to spend time with my father after he died. And now she watches it a few times a week still to spend time with him. Um, so, but, you know, I would keep notes at night during the process of shooting just of the most incredible things that happened that day. And I would fall asleep on my keyboard and then wake up and go, go back there the next morning, like right away. So I look back at those notes and that really gave me a guide as to like where everything was. And that's kind of why I set the Nest camera up too. I set it up because I knew that I didn't want to pay attention to the filmmaking process that much, um, aside from like making sure the shots were good. I didn't want to um, be labeling things. And, and I, didn't, I certainly wasn't going to start processing cards, you know? So I wanted to make sure the nest was there so that we knew the sequence of what happened. And I would try to take notes about some of the moments that like really stood out to me or lines that my father said that I, I wanted to remember forever. It's almost like keeping a journal, you know? And those notes were really, really helpful to me when I decided to officially like make a film. Um, I started there and Jenny and I just sat next to each other on two avids and again, very intimate process. Um, that yielded this. Lots of tears, lots of laughter. Um, it's a very cathartic film in a lot of ways. And I feel like it's that way for the audience, but it also was that way for us making it. So. I love the word you used, cathartic. Um, we see a lot of documentaries about death. Um, and this documentary is, you know, for anybody who's ever grieved, we're grieving all over again, not only for your family and the loss of your father, but also for the people that we've lost in our lives. And so it's definitely a good hour of crying. <laughs> and <sighs> you've learned a lot about death throughout the making of this. And I'm sure everybody who's watched this has learned a lot about death. But what did you learn about life while making this documentary? I mean, I learned about, um, I learned what really matters. You know, I, I learned immeasurable things about life because what is incredible about this period of time um, before death is that only what's most important rises to the surface and everything else goes away. Nothing else matters. And that's why I put that finance planning meeting in there, you know, because you are like counting down the days with me, right? And you're about to lose this man that, the way I hoped to, to, to structure the film 
tell me if I got it right, was I wanted to, to have dad be this disembodied voice in a hospital that I can't reach. And I felt like hundreds of thousands of people would relate to that because of COVID and losing people that they couldn't touch and they couldn't help. And that's how I felt in the, that time. Then thank God for the end of life option act in California, which we as a family had absolutely no idea existed, but it does. So then because of that, he was able to come home and start this waiting period. And when you first see him, I wanted you to see a man who is helpless in a wheelchair, unable to do anything, being lowered into a bed and diapers, you know, a really hard, hard scene to go through. And a lot of people tell me they don't know if they're going to be able to make it through the movie, you know, when they're watching that scene. But what I wanted to do in the edit was really like sort of peel back the onion on this man. And by minute 12, you know, I give an indication of that, like when he tells my sister what he wants to do to Donald Trump. Um, and he's so funny and her reaction is so funny. And then you kind of get a sense of like what the spirit of this film is really going to be like, but also what a, what a feisty firecracker of a man he is, you know, and maybe this could be fun. And because he's now had the ability to choose the day, right? He chose March 3rd and now he is able to enjoy those last weeks. But what I learned was that we don't need to grieve someone while they're alive. We need to celebrate people while they're alive. And every human life is absolutely sacred and beautiful and full of incredible moments of joy and love. And those are the moments that come back up uh, above the surface when someone is approaching death. And um, we as a family, I felt really grateful for the family I have and uh, how we were able to really reunite as the T team around dad again. But because we went through this horrible, you know, accident when he was when when he was only 53 and we were just, you know, nine, eight, were we eight, eight, ten. I was nine. Let me say seven. My brother was seven. I was nine. My sister was 11. And so we were bonded by fire then, you know, and my mother she really turned it into like, we are a team. She was brilliant that way. And that team kind of reunited, but now we're adults and we could each bring different skill sets to and help in that way. And so I feel like it's a story that I lived of what family really can be. Um, and, and I feel like also just that really what matters is as my father says, love those you know and respect those you don't know. And that um, that really the way he conducted himself in his life was what mattered, you know, how he treated the people around him. That's what actually matters. Um, and so all of these trappings of success or failure or whatever it is, you know, like all of this, some things we can control and some we can't, they don't really matter. You know, um, what matters is what, you know, who you are in this world. And um, so I think that's what I learned the most about life. And that it's love. Love is the most important thing. And that we shouldn't hide death from our children or our loved ones, that we should greet it. It is part of life. And by turning away from it, we are robbing our lives of richness, of understanding how finite our lives are. I'm going to give you the last word. Is there anything that we did not talk about that you would love to share? about Last Flight Home? Uh, we're, we're taking, you know, the film really has a life of its own. I've never made anything that helps and heals people like this, that helps them to prepare for closure or to, um, you know, understand how to love and lose and let go. And all of these really important um, parts of being a human being um, that I think not many films get to explore this intimately um, and this with this kind of authenticity. And so the movie has really taken a life of its own. And um, I feel after going through this that the basic right to die with dignity, um, if one is terminally ill, the basic right over our own bodies, uh, which of course has come up a lot with Roe v. Wade. And, you know, in this case, there's not even another embryo involved. There's just our, us and our bodies. And yet it's a right only in 10 states in this union. 
And it's not a right in New York. And this is a doc NYC Q and A. Um, and you can't drive over the bridge to New Jersey where it is a right. So it's very random and it's very unfair to millions of terminally ill people. And the film has this power because of dad and I think because of his kindness um, and his humor to really have people fall in love with him and understand and put a human face on a very terrifying subject. And so the conversation about death and dying is something that the film, we've offered the film in partnership with you know, MTV documentary films and Paramount have been really supportive of offering the film to these organizations and, and making it available for screenings. And it goes on. Like I'm screening it next week in Milwaukee Film Festival. It's playing Neuhaus. It's playing Neuhaus in New York. It's playing in Wales, you know, for the death and dying organization. We're going to bring it to Washington. And we are trying to launch right now an impact campaign and you can find out more about it on my website, interloperfilms.com. We're launching an impact campaign that we hope people will participate in um, because everyone deserves this basic human right. And, and too many people have come up to me after screenings and said my mother like was dying of liver cancer or you know, name the loved one. And they were begging for me to help them. And there was nothing I could do because they were in Florida, you know, or something like that. And so I just feel like my work with this film is not done and I'm not one who usually becomes an activist after one of my films, but I do feel like this is an underserved population and they're not, and, and the, it's, a, it's a topic that it has a stigma because we're all scared of it. But um, I ended up making this film and now I'm on this track to just really try to help people um, gain this basic human right and to just uh, share the film as, as we said, it's a very cathartic experience to see it with an audience and to try to, bring those audiences together and kind of push it to the people that really need it and who can run with it to, to help, um, to help all of us, because we all go through this. None of us, none of us gets out of here alive. So. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> um, Andy, I want to thank you so much for being here on our proverbial stage. Um, I also want to thank uh, Paramount Plaza and MTV Documentary Films for allowing us to screen Last Light Home. Such an amazing story. Um, I'm speechless. I was trying not to cry the entire time, but you really got me at the end. We definitely learn a lot more about a life when we actually accept death and the decisions we need to make when we want to accept death. So. Make sure for everybody at home and watching this in the cinemas that you recommend this film to a friend. And we hope to see you at another spring showcase for Doc NYC. Thank you again so much, Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Samara.